Uh, Rick Wilson is a Republican political operative. You've probably seen him here on MSNBC. Uh, he's appeared on lots of different shows. Um, part of the reason he is such a popular guest is that he uh, is not only very connected in Republican politics and knows a lot about what's going on inside the party, he's also got a really good sense of humor, uh, which makes him great on TV. And he's one of that endangered species of modern Republicans that is not afraid to be very vocally critical of President Trump. Um, and for Rick Wilson, that has been true all along. He was a Marco Rubio supporter in the Republican presidential primary last year. But unlike a lot of other professional Republicans, including Senator Rubio himself, Rick Wilson didn't decide to eat his criticism of Donald Trump once Trump won the nomination and ultimately the election. He has he is stuck with his critique. He's the unusual high-profile Republican who started off as a, a, a no-to-Trump guy, and he remains a no-to-Trump guy. And he's not the only one. There are some, but not many. Back during the election last year, last July, which was right after we started getting the first reporting about how Russia appeared to be involved in the hacking attacks on the Democratic Party's email servers, um, last July, Rick Wilson got a call from a reporter about something very strange and honestly very worrying that was starting to circulate about Donald Trump. An investigative reporter in the TV news business called up Rick Wilson and said, hey, basically, you're a never Trump guy. Have you heard anything about this private intel operation that has turned up supposedly a whole sheaf of allegations about Trump being connected to Russia? about Russia having compromising material on Trump and Trump being involved or at least informed about this, this Russia hacking the Democratic Party. He got a, a, a call that was an inquiry as to whether or not he'd heard that stuff. He's a guy who, you know, hears about opposition research. He's been involved at a professional level in Republican politics for a long time. Hey, buddy, you heard about this? That call last July, that's how Rick Wilson learned. Uh, that's, that's the way a lot of people learned that there was something out there, rumored, right, described vaguely, something out there about Trump that seemed like it might be really worse than your standard political oppo in this country. Last July, around that time, there were a bunch of reporters who started hearing about this private intel project that had turned up this Russia-specific information about Donald Trump. Now, it was just people talking about it. Um, nobody published anything on it for months. But lots of reporters did try to chase it down, and the way you try to chase things down is exactly what you think. You try to retrace the steps of the purported investigator as best you can to try to independently corroborate what's in these reports that you've heard about. You call all the sources you know who might conceivably have heard something about this to see if they can give you any other detail, any other angle on what you're trying to track down. You call around, you talk to sources, you work what you've got. And that process last summer of re reporters calling around to their sources to check out this rumored thing that they had heard about, that was the very casual way that a lot of people in Washington first heard about the supposed dossier, which we now call it the dossier, of alleged Russian dirt on Donald Trump. Now, David Korn of Mother Jones Magazine, he did get out ahead of the pack. He was first to publish a piece on this Intel project, this Intel reporting on Trump. He published just before election on Halloween night last year. In his piece, David Korn described a former Western intelligence officer who was well respected in his field, who had gathered this inflammatory information on Trump that was starting to circulate in political circles. But again, because the Intel itself, the allegations themselves, about Trump hadn't been independently verified by the journalists who were hearing about it and reporting on it, the intel really could only be described in very, very vague terms. Until finally, well after the election was over, it all broke open. Um, what broke the dam on this story seems to have been the news that leaked in early January um, that the, the product of this private intelligence operation the report that was produced by that intelligence operation about Trump and Russia. It was leaked information in the first 10 days of January that that reporting, which had been rumored for all these months, it was now being taken seriously enough by the U.S. intelligence community that the findings of that report 
had been summarized and briefed to the outgoing president, Barack Obama, and to the incoming president-elect, Donald Trump. CNN was first to break that story uh, right at the beginning of January. And that went off like a flashbang grenade in the news when CNN broke that story. But if, it, it led immediately to the obvious urgent follow-up question. Okay, they've been briefed on this intel. They've been briefed on this thing. We've all been hearing rumors about it. What is it? <laughs> What does this intel actually say? What is this inflammatory, explosive information that has now been briefed to the president and the president-elect? What is it? And that's where BuzzFeed came in to blow the whole thing open. On January 10th, less than two weeks before the inauguration, BuzzFeed went ahead and did it. They uploaded the report, 35 pages of it. Turns out David Corn was right. It was from a respected former Western intelligence operative, a former MI6 agent from Britain. And as had been hinted about and rumored for months, the claims in this intelligence product, in this report, they were in fact lurid. Even if you only got through the first couple of pages and then put it down and reacquainted yourself with the other side of your stomach, even if you didn't make it all the way through all 35 pages, right up front it was very blunt and the thing that got the most attention initially was a description of alleged salacious personal behavior by the president-elect that russia had supposed documentary evidence of the implication being that russia could use that tape of his behavior to blackmail him and that's that's the thing that resonated most loudly at first for obvious reasons but if you could get past that alleged x-rated stuff what was also made clear in that dossier was that Russia didn't necessarily need to blackmail him, whether or not they had a tape. What was in the dossier was a spelled out, detailed allegation that there was a, a mutual operation underway here, that there was collaboration and coordination between the Trump campaign and the Russians, yes, during the election as the Russians tried to hurt Hillary Clinton and her chances in the election. But that was the product of a long-standing, years-long relationship between the Russians and Donald Trump. Um, quoting from the dossier, quote, the Russian authorities had been cultivating and supporting U.S. Republican presidential candidate Donald Trump for at least five years. Quote, Trump and his inner circle have accepted a regular flow of intelligence from the Kremlin, including on his Democratic and other political rivals. Quote, in terms of specifics, the Kremlin has been feeding Trump and his team valuable intelligence on his opponents, including Democratic presidential candidate Hillary Clinton. Now, I mentioned just a moment ago that uh, people in political circles and journalistic circles first started hearing rumors about the existence of this intel right after we learned that Russian hackers had been involved in breaking into the DNC and stealing those Democratic Party documents back in June. Well, there's a lot of detail in the dossier on that part of the Russian attack specifically. Quote, the Russian regime was behind the recent leak of embarrassing email messages emanating from the Democratic National Committee to the WikiLeaks platform. Quote, the reason for using WikiLeaks was plausible deniability by the Russian regime and the operation was conducted with the full knowledge of Trump and senior members of his campaign team. So, this was all made public the night of January 10th by BuzzFeed. It created a huge uproar, right? The day after BuzzFeed posted it and everything went nuts, the New York Times contacted Republican operative Rick Wilson as part of their reporting on the impact of this dossier now that it had been made public. They're reporting on also the, the, the backstory as to when people first started hearing about this information, how long it had been circulating, how it ended up coming into the public domain. Um, even though Rick Wilson had first heard about the existence of this intel months earlier, last summer, seeing it all come out in black and white in January, according to him, was a different thing altogether. He told the Times in January, quote, it is a remarkable moment in U.S. history. What world did I wake up in? That's always stuck with me since that first came out. What world is this? No, that was January. It is now seven months down the road. Trump is president. He's facing multiple investigations into his Russia ties. Multiple committees in both houses of Congress are investigating his Russia ties. Former FBI director Robert Mueller is leading a special counsel inquiry into his Russia ties. The Russia issue is not just an area of focus for this presidency and for this president. It appears to be increasingly an object of fixation for this president, probably for good reason 
given the seriousness of the investigations that he's facing. Uh, Jonathan Martin at the New York Times last night tweeted that a Republican senator had just called him to tell him that Trump is, quote, consumed with Russia. An unknown senior, unnamed senior Republican aide told Politico tonight, quote, it seems Trump is just always focused on Russia. That quote comes as part of new reporting tonight from uh, Josh Dazi and Elena Shore at Politico that Trump in recent weeks has been calling Republican senators and berating them. That's the word Politico uses, berating them on issues related to Russia. Politico tonight describing uh, Trump calling Republican Senator Bob Corker to yell at him and complain to him about a Russia sanctions bill that Corker had sponsored and supported. Political also describes the president dialing up Senator Tom Tillis from North Carolina, calling him on August 7th to complain to Tom Tillis about a bill he was working on that was designed to prevent Trump from firing the special counsel, Robert Mueller, who is looking into the Russia matter. And it's kind of interesting. There's two different levels to look at this, right? All this reporting about the president, you know, calling senators about Russia, not being able to let go of Russia, talking about Russia all the time. It's all evidence that the president is sort of centrally focused on Russia at the moment. But if you step back from it for a second, it's also evidence that lots of Republican sources are willing to tell reporters about that now. Republican sources, congressional aides, senior Republican congressional aides, maybe even Republican senators themselves are now getting very comfortable calling up reporters to tell the press how fixated Trump is on Russia and what he's been saying to them about Russia in individual private conversations. And that includes this bombshell report from the New York Times last night with multiple Republican sources claiming to the Times that Trump isn't just randomly calling up Republicans and yelling at them about Russia. When it comes to Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell, according to these Republican sources in the Times, Trump called McConnell on August 9th to berate him and swear at him and scream at him about Mitch McConnell not protecting the president from the Russia investigations that are being conducted under McConnell's purview in the Senate. The president, of course, is already reportedly facing an obstruction of justice inquiry from Robert Mueller due to him firing the FBI director, James Comey, after Comey reportedly rejected the president's pressure on him to stop the FBI investigation into the Russia matter. So what's another obstruction of justice inquiry on top of that? Two scoops. So, so all of this is proceeding, right? All of these investigations are ongoing. Republican sources are in getting increasingly aggressive against the president, specifically on the Russia issue. And now today, it comes full circle. Because today, more than a year after those rumors started circulating about some weird intel sheaf of private stuff that's been disclosed about, after those rumors started circulating, more than a year from that, seven months down the road from when we first laid eyes on this crazy private intelligence effort, right, that produced this almost unbelievable sheaf of reports about Trump and Russia, seven months down the road from when we first saw the dossier, we're back to the dossier in a way that may be a big problem for the White House if the dossier is at all real. Yesterday, we reported that the firm that hired Christopher Steele, that XMI6 agent who got all that intelligence who did the dossier, the head of the American firm who hired him to do it, Fusion GPS, was interviewed yesterday by the staff of the Senate Judiciary Committee for 10 solid hours. Uh, we can also confirm tonight that um, Glenn Simpson, the head of Fusion GPS, did hand over 40,000 pages of documents to the committee as well. That was first reported by Fox News last night. We can confirm it tonight. But even if you put aside 40,000 pages of documents, Think about his 10 hour long interview. We know what it was about. I mean, the only reason the head of Fusion GPS was talking to the Senate Judiciary Committee for five minutes, let alone 10 hours, was because of that firm's role in commissioning the Trump Russia dossier. When the head of the firm, Glenn Simpson, came out of his interview, his lawyer made a statement making clear that the dossier was the subject of the interview. And even though everybody's now grown accustomed to habitually describing the dossier as uncorroborated and unverified, that's not the way that Fusion GPS views it. Um, Richard Benveniste is a 
famous American political figure, particularly when it comes to investigations of complicated national scandals. Richard Benveniste was a Watergate prosecutor. He was also a member of the 9-11 Commission. When Glenn Simpson came out of that 10 hours of testimony yesterday with the Judiciary Committee, his lawyer quoted Richard Benveniste in calling the Trump-Russia dossier, quote, a roadmap for the investigation. They want the congressional committees and the FBI and all of these other professional investigations, they want all those investigators to follow the dossier. Check it out. They want the dossier to be the basis of other people's investigations. They are volunteering it. Check it out. They say they stand by their work. They say they are proud of their work. By their work, they mean the dossier. And even though the White House and people from the Trump campaign and the Trump administration keep denouncing it as like this dodgy dossier and reporters routinely talk about it as unverified and uncorroborated, you know what? That's less and less true all the time. This thing was made public by BuzzFeed in January. By February, we had the first substantive reports that a lot of it was starting to independently check out. Investigators were following up what bits of it they could and were finding that the dossier was true. Quote, U.S. intelligence intercepts confirmed that some of the conversations described in the dossier took place between the same individuals on the same days and from the same locations as detailed in the dossier. I mean, that was just by February. After that, there was further cooperation of things like the, the specific details mentioned in the dossier about Russian staff who were based at the U.S. Embassy in Washington who had to get sent home in the middle of the scandal. I mean, even stuff like that about the Russian side of it, those too, those details too were checking out when people were able to independently verify them. The important thing that's now new here is that Fusion GPS is basically having to make itself known because of this testimony to Congress by the founder of Fusion GPS. And now that they've been sort of forced to ask, answer questions about this stuff, they are inviting scrutiny of this dossier. They are standing by it publicly. And we know that the dossier itself was delivered to the FBI. It's been reported that the delivery of the dossier to the FBI by Christopher Steele included him giving the FBI information on who his sources were that he used to create the document, again, to further help them verify his information. Now, as of today, we know we've got 10 hours of testimony on that dossier yesterday in the Judici Judiciary Committee. And I have to say, the dossier remains a series of allegations, but you know what? None of them have been overtly disproved through all these months of public investigation since it was first posted online. And that brings us tonight to Mount Air, Iowa. Mount A-Y-R. It's a small town, about 1,700 people, south central Iowa. It's a really out of the way place. Um, it's a part of Iowa I have never been to, so I looked it up on Google Earth today. Other nearby towns around Mount Air, Iowa, have amazing names like Gravity, Iowa, Diagonal, Iowa, and Siam, Iowa. I have never been to that part of Iowa, now I wanna go. I especially wanna go after seeing this footage tonight from Senator Chuck Grassley's town hall in Mount Air. The second thing I'd like to talk on is uh, Senate Judiciary Committee staff members met for 10 hours. I would like to know what they discovered in that meeting, and I would like the transcripts released. Will you do that? Yeah. Uh, the answer is uh, it'll t I, it take a vote of the committee to do it, but I presume that they will be re reduced. But if you heard from the lawyer for Simpson in the evening news, uh, the, f the fact that we were going to release it, we can't release it until we give uh, Simpson and his lawyer a copy of it. So if there's something that the transcript is wrong, give them an opportunity to, to change it or to correct it or at least to negotiate what, what was uh, typed. First of all, it takes a long time for the court reporter to get it uh, ready to go. But we'll have to give it to them before the, the thing you're asking me about can be done. And will you do that? Uh, of course, we'll put it to a, a vote of the committee, see. But here's what might happen as a result of this. We have not given up the possibility that we would have uh, Trump Jr. and Simpson and uh, Manafort, if it depends on what comes out of these transcripts, 
maybe there has to be an open session, but that's something that we're going to wait until we get done with. It. Will you personally vote yeah. for the release of the transcripts? I don't know why I wouldn't, but I don't want to say so because I never, uh, in all the years I've been in Congress, well, I guess I've only been chairman of two committees and chairman of this one just three years. I've never gone through this process before. So I'm not going to answer your question until I get a firm footing of what the precedent is. Well, my statement is I want to see those transcripts. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. You, but you understand the necessity of giving it to them to make sure it's correct. Absolutely, but I don't see that that would yeah. take a long amount of time to yeah. do so. Uh, I would guess even better than what you're asking to be done is if we decide to have a hearing, an open hearing on this issue with those three people. So, well, if, if it's already been said for 10 hours, release that and then, then have your open hearing. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> I don't know who that guy was at the town hall, but... I love you. <laughs> Senator Chuck Grassley tonight speaking with one of his absolutely persistent and well-informed and plain-spoken constituents at home uh, in South Central Iowa. And I think what he just indicated there, I think what the Senator just indicated there is that he'll vote for the release of the transcript of the 10 hours of testimony that the founder of Fusion GPS just did yesterday about the Trump Russia dossier. He said he has to check with precedent, but he doesn't see any reason why he'd vote against releasing that document. Now, in, ter in terms of this issue of the transcript having to go back to Glenn Simpson and Fusion GPS so they could review it before it could be made public, um, Chuck Grassley seems to think that would be some sort of major barrier to releasing the transcript. Like my new boyfriend in Mount Air, Iowa, <laughs> I don't think that would be a major barrier to releasing the transcript, and I'll tell you why. Tonight, we have just, in the last few minutes, received um, a statement from Josh Levy, who is Glenn Simpson's lawyer, uh, responding to what Senator Grassley just said. This statement is exclusive to us. It's very interesting. You ready? Here goes. Quote, Yesterday, Glenn Simpson spent the entire day answering questions of the Senate Judiciary Committee staff, pursuant to a written agreement from the committee's chair and ranking member that was reached some weeks ago. Mr. Simpson told the truth and so far has been the only witness to fully cooperate with the committee. The transcript reveals all of Mr. Simpson's testimony based on the hours of questioning from staff. The committee can release the transcript if it so chooses. But after spending an entire day answering questions and zero testimony from any other witness, calling Mr. Simpson to a hearing, I think he means an open hearing, serves no investigative purpose other than to try to find out the identities of clients and sources which are protected as matters of privilege and in the case of sources, protected as matters of safety. Uh, we appreciate the opportunity to review the transcript and we'll do so. At the end of the day, that transcript is the committee's. It's not ours. Okay. Do you see what's about to happen here? The reason this is such a big deal is because again, nothing in the dossier has been overtly disproved. And if it really is a roadmap to the investigation, well, that's a very serious roadmap to somewhere for the Trump White House, because the two main claims in the dossier are that Russia was cultivating Trump for years, including them collecting information on him for years that could potentially oblige him to do Russia's bidding. And the other part of it is that it alleges overt knowing collusion between Trump and Russia in Russia's effort to interfere in the presidential election in order to hurt Hillary Clinton. That's what the dossier says. And if the dossier is now about to be publicly defended and explained and backed up, I mean, that's conceivably the whole ballgame. When is the Judiciary Committee going to take that vote? We'll be right back. Hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching MSNBC on YouTube. If you want to keep up to date with the videos we're putting out, you can click subscribe just below me or click over on this list to see lots of other great videos.